Back in 2016, I had the opportunity to see the Ernest Hemingway Between Two Wars Special Exhibition at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum in Boston, Massachusetts. Now that was well before I started this YouTube channel, but I was first getting into photos and film around that time. Eventually I was able to make some videos from Boston based off that footage, including one on the JFK Library and their rather awful videos. I was quite young and had no idea what I was doing, but it's been a while so I wanted to revisit this very special exhibit that I got to see, though I apologize for the horrid photos and videos that I have to use for this. So the Ernest Hemingway Between Two Wars exhibit was here at the JFK Library in 2016 because they have a lot of Hemingway stuff. Years after Hemingway's death in 1961, his last wife Mary donated all of his personal papers and articles to the newly established John F. Kennedy Presidential Library. So along with having the largest collection of Kennedy artifacts and materials, this place also has the world's largest collection of Ernest Hemingway manuscripts and artifacts. Sadly, they had never really exhibited their Hemingway treasures here, so this exhibit was a big deal. However, I think they've made a new permanent Hemingway exhibit since 2016. So Ernest Hemingway led a fascinating life. Most of his legendary adventures and greatest works happened between the two world wars and he participated in both wars to some degree, this exhibit is contained to that era. The main reason this collection was donated to the JFK Library of all places was because a lot of Hemingway's personal belongings and files were at Finca Vajilla, his home in Cuba, and obviously he wasn't able to travel there over the last years of his life. After Ernest Hemingway's death, President Kennedy actually facilitated the travel of Mary Hemingway to retrieve his belongings from Havana and bring them back to the US. Again, sorry for the blurriness in some of these photos, but this was a letter written by Ernest to his father in 1925, detailing his artistic credo. He says that, quote, When you see anything of mine that you don't like, remember that I'm sincere in doing it, and I'm working towards something. During young Hemingway's time with the Kansas City Star newspaper, he wrote that the best rules of writing are to use short sentences, use short first paragraphs, use vigorous English, avoid adjectives, and eliminate every superfluous word. This is a copy of the Tabula, the literary magazine from Hemingway's high school, in which he published his first short story, The Judgment of Manitou. In 1917, Hemingway volunteered to be a Red Cross ambulance driver in Europe during World War I, but he was struck by a mortar shell while handing out chocolate to Italian soldiers. On the right are some good luck charms Hemingway kept from World War I, including some bullet fragments and a meal token. This is pretty neat. The authentic first Nick Adams story, which he wrote while recovering in a hospital at Milan. The Nick Adams stories were largely autobiographical, many based from his childhood summers in Michigan. But in this first one, Nick is injured by a trench mortar and is later lying in a sickbed examining his medals, which were identical to Hemingway's, and he considers suicide. These are Hemingway's medals from World War I, Italy awarded him with the War Merit Cross, and the Silver Medal of Military Valor. While recovering in the hospital, he fell in love with his nurse, Agnes von Kurowski. She eventually ended the relationship after hinting they would marry, which crushed Hemingway. This is actually one of Agnes's diary entries from August 1918, in which she talks about Hemingway, that Ernie is far too fond of me, this is a letter written by Hemingway's friend Bill Horn, responding to Ernest after Agnes broke off from him. Hemingway's friend tells him that even though she may pass, the truths that she represented cannot. They are forever. Hemingway was disappointed with this treatment after he came home from the war. He wasn't exactly treated like a man in great war here like he had hoped, and his sentiments are indicated in the short story Soldier's Home. And this is the earliest draft of Soldier's Home, written on telegraph office stationery. The 1920s is a fascinating era for Hemingway, as he rose to prominence while living in Paris. As mentioned, Hemingway moved to Paris, France in 1921, and lived there throughout most of the 20s. This is a photo taken from the apartment window of Ernest and his first wife Hadley in 1922. This was the first letter Hemingway received from Gertrude Stein. It's an invitation to have tea at her famed salon. 
Here's a photo of Gertrude Stein's salon and studio, which was filled with modernist art. She had lots of creative literary and artistic minds visit regularly. Here's a little display on Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald. They had an interesting but complex and rivalrous relationship. This is a letter written to Hemingway by Fitzgerald after he read through a manuscript of The Sun Also Rises. Fitzgerald marked it up pretty significantly, though he concluded that it was damn good. Hemingway did follow some of Fitzgerald's advice and deleted these pages from the first and second chapters of The Sun Also Rises. The Sun Also Rises was Hemingway's first novel about American and British expats living in Paris after World War I, which is based on Hemingway and his friends living in Paris after the war. He also talks about their trip to Pamplona, Spain for the running of the bulls. This is a typescript for The Sun Also Rises, which was later included into a movable feast, where he writes that Gertrude Stein called the young expatriate Americans in Paris as being part of a lost generation. This was a letter to Hemingway from his friend John Dos Passos. They became friends in Pamplona, and this was a letter written years later reminiscing on that experience of the fiesta. Here's a copy of The Sun Also Rises inscribed by Hemingway, and next to it is a notebook used by Hemingway to document his progress. He originally called the novel Fiesta. On the left is a second draft notebook for The Sun Also Rises from 1925, and the book on the right contained plot outlines for the chapters. On the left is the handwritten first page of The Sun Also Rises. And next to it is a postcard of the bullfighter Nino de la Palma, collected by Hemingway in Spain. Hemingway did become a big fan of Spanish bullfighting. Of course, he writes about it in The Sun Also Rises. F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote this letter to Hemingway while on a ship back to New York. In this, he consoles Hemingway about the divorce from his first wife, and says that Hemingway's friendship was the highlight of his time in Europe. This is a telegram sent by Dorothy Parker to Hemingway, congratulating him on the success of The Sun Also Rises. This is a letter sent to Hemingway by a critic named Edmund Wilson, calling The Sun Also Rises a knockout. Here's a copy of Hemingway's first book, titled Three Stories and Ten Poems from 1924. Only 300 issues were printed, and Hemingway inscribed this copy to Edmund Wilson. There's also an early cover design. Here is the handwritten first page of the earliest surviving draft, and a typescript draft of the short story up in Michigan that he wrote in 1922. Gertrude Stein went over the typescript and warned him that it was inacrochable, which is French for a bit too erotic. At the bottom is the original beginning to Indian Camp. He originally introduces the theme of death much earlier in the story, but Hemingway rejected his first eight pages of the story, and at the top is the revised typescript of Indian Camp from 1924. This is a draft of Big Two-Hearted River, another short story based on his boyhood in Michigan that he wrote in 1924, with his character Nick Adams once again returning. His second novel, A Farewell to Arms, is about an American ambulance driver who is wounded in the Italian front, then falls in love with a British nurse at a Milan hospital. So there are some serious similarities to real life, as is the case in most of his novels. That is an incredible quotation from A Farewell to Arms. These are the first two pages of the first draft of A Farewell to Arms, begun by Hemingway in March of 1928 while in Paris. This is a sheet from a typescript draft of A Farewell to Arms. Hemingway had F. Scott Fitzgerald read over this, and on this page, though it's barely legible now, Fitzgerald scribbled in that this is one of the most beautiful pages in all English literature. These are F. Scott Fitzgerald's handwritten notes for Hemingway. After reading a draft, I wish I had gotten a closer picture of it, but at the end Hemingway wrote in his response to Fitzgerald's criticisms, Kiss my ass. Hemingway would decide on a title for a story after he finished it, and this is a handwritten list Hemingway made of potential titles for what became A Farewell to Arms. You can see the winning title towards the top left. This is a galley proof that a copy editor edited with black ink. When this was returned to Hemingway, he wrote on it, in pencil, who buggered this up like this? This is a letter written by Hemingway to his editor Maxwell Perkins, expressing his disappointment with the small type and design of the book jacket for A Farewell to Arms. 
He says, all I get out of this book is disappointment. But it did become a bestseller and make him a lot of money, so it wasn't all doom and gloom for Hemingway. And here they have an original copy of A Farewell to Arms from 1929. Over a million copies of this book have been sold by the time of Hemingway's death. This is a handwritten ending for A Farewell to Arms. Hemingway rewrote it 39 times before he was satisfied with it. This is a portrait of Ernest Hemingway, titled Kid Balzac, which was this artist's nickname for Hemingway. This was done by the artist Waldo Pierce. He met Hemingway in 1927 and made this portrait in 1929, based off of a daguerreotype of the famed French novelist Honoré de Balzac. Hemingway kept this portrait for the rest of his life. There in the corner it says, For Ernest, Key West. Now the exhibit moves into the 1930s. Hemingway left Paris in 1929 for Key West, Florida, all while he became increasingly famous and was still traveling quite a bit. Hemingway was a legendary fisherman. He would fish for big marlin around Key West and in Cuba. That's a real photo of him with some ginormous marlins. This is a manuscript for Marlin off Cuba, an essay about marlin fishing off the Cuban coast that Hemingway published in a fishing magazine. This is one of Hemingway's fishing logs. These logs became a basis for scenes in The Old Man in the Sea. He used this one on his Cuba trip from April to July of 1933. This is a copy of the Bullfighter by the famed Spanish cubist Juan Gris. Hemingway purchased this in 1931 and included this image as the original front piece for Death in the Afternoon, his book about Spanish bullfighting. Hemingway attended lots of bullfights in Spain throughout the 1920s and into the 1930s. Now there are some serious ethical issues with bullfighting, but Hemingway wouldn't have cared for that. His artist friend Waldo Pierce was also a fan of bullfighting. He went with Hemingway to Pamplona in 1927, where he sketched this bull licking a man. Here is the revised and corrected typescript of the first pages of Death in the Afternoon, which he had published in 1932. Here is an original copy of Death in the Afternoon, with the Juan Gris painting as the front piece. Hemingway wrote that the only place where you could see life and death, now that the wars were over, was in the bull ring. They have a display on the short happy life of Francis McComer, a short story about fear and courage while hunting game in Africa. These are two pages from the earliest surviving draft of the short happy life of Francis McComer from 1934. This did become his most popular short story. And here is another list of titles Hemingway made out, eventually deciding on the short happy life of Francis McComer. Okay, this is pretty awesome. The mount of an Impala that was shot by Ernest Hemingway. He shot this Impala either in Kenya or Tanzania in 1933, and then had its head taxidermied. He did have a lot of taxidermy trophies, based off of his first big African safari, in which he was accompanied by Philip Percival, who decades earlier had accompanied President Theodore Roosevelt on his African safari, Hemingway wrote The Green Hills of Africa. Here is a corrected typescript of pages from Green Hills of Africa, which was published in 1935. And here is an original copy of Hemingway's safari memoir. Hemingway made out this list of trophies he had accumulated on the safari while on board a steamer from Africa to Europe. That is a lot. Here are some photos from that safari, including Hemingway posing with a rhinoceros that he killed, and his wife Pauline with a gazelle. In 1936, civil war broke out in Hemingway's beloved Spain, so he took the chance when he was invited to cover the war as a correspondent for the North American Newspaper Alliance and visited the war-torn country four times between 1937 and 1938. Naturally, he did go a little beyond his journalist duties. Here's a photo of Hemingway taken during the Battle of Teruel, showing a journalist taking aim at some fascists. Nothing wrong with that. This was a dispatch by Hemingway about the Battle of Teruel, a very bloody and important battle that the Nationalists won. 
Here's a 1938 paperback containing all of Hemingway's dispatches from the Spanish Civil War. Hemingway was involved with an anti-fascist propaganda film made in 1937 during the Civil War called The Spanish Earth. He was one of the writers and narrators alongside Orson Welles. After Hemingway's experience in the Spanish Civil War, in which the fascists successfully took over the nation, he wrote For Whom the Bell Tolls, about an American fighting in the war. This is the first page of a typescript with handwritten notes of For Whom the Bell Tolls from 1939. This is a photograph of Hemingway editing the typescript in his room at the Sun Valley Lodge in Sun Valley, Idaho, where he wrote most of the novel. I actually had the opportunity to stay and sleep in that room at the Sun Valley Lodge a few months after I visited this exhibit. It was an incredible experience. This is an original For Whom the Bell Tolls publicity picture design. Ernest Hemingway wrote this letter in 1935 and predicted the Second World War in it. It was a draft for his essay titled Notes on the Next War, a serious topical letter in which he warns that Germany, under Hitler, wants a war of revenge, wants it fervently, patriotically, and almost religiously. As the fascists took over Spain, Germany began its invasions, and Hemingway's prediction certainly came to pass. He had become familiar with the consequences of war during the First World War, in which he was nearly killed, but in 1944 he went back to Europe as a reporter for Collier's magazine. Here's the perilous voyage of victory, Hemingway's account of the Normandy landings, which Collier's printed as a separate promotional pamphlet. This was Hemingway's visa, issued by the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. He almost had this visa stripped, as he was accused of effectively being a colonel to French resistance troops, and being in possession of mines, grenades, and war maps, though he did get cleared. However, he totally had all that stuff and did all those things and was going far beyond his war correspondent duties. These were Ernest Hemingway's dog tags, worn during World War II. He was wearing these as he watched the D-Day landings. This is a letter from a former Collier's editor to Hemingway taking issue with Hemingway's claims of expenses. Of course he was staying at the Ritz in Paris and drinking a lot. Hemingway reported on, and was actively involved, with the Battle of Herkenwald through the fall and into the winter of 1944, one of the longest and bloodiest battles ever fought by the U.S. Army. This was Hemingway's army field map of the Herkin Forest. The red dots mark known German positions. These are pages from an unpublished short story that Hemingway wrote about the horrors of Herkenwald. Hemingway spent that battle living in a woodcutter's hut. During the battle, Hemingway did kill at least one German soldier who is probably a dispatch writer. This is a letter that fellow writer J.D. Salinger sent to Hemingway from a psychiatric hospital in Nuremberg in July of 1945. He suffered from combat fatigue covering the war, and in this letter he claims that the only hopeful minutes of the whole business was meeting Hemingway. Hemingway met Mary Welsh, who would become his fourth wife, in London during the war, and this is a letter Hemingway sent to Mary in 1945, in which he reminisces about being a kid in Chicago. This was Hemingway's silver flask, believed to have been a gift from Mary. And here's a photo of Ernest and Mary Hemingway outside the Sun Valley Lodge in 1947. Again, I did get to stay there, and have a really old video on it. They actually moved to the Sun Valley area towards the end of Hemingway's life. So that was an amazing exhibit. I had forgotten about a lot of the fascinating documents and artifacts they had on display here. Sadly, this exhibit is long gone, but I have heard that they now have a new permanent display based on the Hemingway archives of the JFK Library, which I would very much like to see. Plus, I really want to get back to the JFK Library and Museum to film a new and better video on it, as well as to visit the other Kennedy sites in the Boston area. If you enjoyed this video, then please like it, share it, and subscribe to my channel. Also check out my other videos on some Hemingway related sites, plus I do have a lot more that I plan to get to. I also have lots of other museum and historic site tours, filmed here in the US and in Europe. 
Thanks for watching.